Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Hi Mark and welcome to the new year and a new set of question and answer sessions for you. So we've got a whole load of new members that have joined over Christmas and January. So welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for coming on board and being willing to take on some new ideas from Mark. We're going to help you as much as we can and we're going to kick off with a huge Q&A session for 2023. The first topic we're going to talk about, Mark, today is going to be about helping horses that are highly nervous on the ground. We're going to talk about a really nervous Brumby. So that's a wild horse for anyone that doesn't come from Australia. And it's just not able to cope with people coming close to it at all. We're going to talk about a standard bred who has an explosion and how to manage that. And we're going to talk about other horses that just aren't aware of your boundary and how we can establish ourselves in the best way possible and manage these horses. So we'll kick off Mark with the first question from Samantha. So she's a new member, so welcome Samantha. She has a two year old Brumby and he was caught only about eight months ago. A really sweet boy, but mega anxious, very um, anxious around new people, slight noises and slight movements. Everything makes him spook and bolt. She's been doing small amounts of groundwork, just enough for him, and he's okay with her. But new people, even children, he's very unsure about. When she has the rope halter on him, which isn't very often, it seems to make it worse. If someone walks into the paddock while she has the halter on, he will rear up and pull back and then bolt on her. There's no way that she can hold the rope when he does this. He desperately needs a barrier. She has had one come out. And he was great with him, but again, it was a really big deal. Pulling back on the lead rope and bolting. Have you got any tips for her on how to settle his anxiety? Thanks. Uh, Yeah, it's it's tough with wild horses and especially the really sensitive ones. You know, I've seen a lot of Brumbies that have uh, come out of the wild and they can be, you know, within days, they just, you know, seem like cream puffs that, you know, that have been around people, you know, quite a lot and then you get others that are, that are super sensitive and hyper vigilant and yeah they're, they're on the lookout all the time um much the same as some rescue horses that i've come across that uh you know i've had in clinics and and every new person that walks in that arena and everything that sort of happens uh in their radius they're they're, they're super sensitive too so so yeah it is difficult um and the hardest thing is is like trying to be a good listener and also a a person that empowers the horse at the same time. And this is where with the really sensitive horses, you can fall into a little bit of a trap because they're so expressive. They don't, they tell the truth at every single moment. You know, what I, what I say to people at clinics and and it's not that horses lie, they tell the truth. But um, when I say you've got to get your horse to tell the truth, I'll be talking like about a shutdown horse or something like that. That's uh, stop communicating with people, just like a person can hide the truth by not talking or not, not um, communicating. So, um, so what, what I'd really suggest, <clears throat> excuse me, what I suggest and what really works well is um, a constant sort of, you know, dialect where you're the one that's encouraging the horse to move, but not by your energies and stuff like that. And this is where the lead rope, because the horse is pulling away a lot in that lead rope. So you can work that horse on a long, long lead rope um but what i'd encourage instead of falling into the trap of constantly using approach and retreat to walk up to it all the time um you know see if you can get the lead rope on the holder on and then the rest of the lesson while you've got that holder on um trying to encourage it to come into your conversation a lot so instead of like because when you walk up to them they're, they're, they're very expressive with their bubble and and you know if you walk in too quick then uh, they'll be quickly uh, looking for an exit and then, 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 then go into that flight response. And oftentimes we try to be good horse trainers and buy into that all the time. So we walk up like gurus to those horses, like, you know, it, it, um, listening to their bubble. Uh, so we walk up and the horse gets nervous, so we stop and then we step back and, you know, things like that. And that's things I encourage uh, people to do at certain times with certain horses, but you don't want to buy into it too much with those horses 
Um, and I know that sounds a bit like, oh, but, but I thought we're supposed to listen, otherwise I'll stop talking. Well, no, it's not that you stop listening and you sort of smother them or block, block them in a corner. It's, it's what you do is you, you, you kind of get them to follow a feel and think and follow and think and follow. So you kind of reverse approach and retreat in the sense that um, you would be sort of at the start with them, you'd be drawing a little bit like backing up around a safe yard, you know, not, not in the rocks because if you're walking backwards, you don't want to trip over. So and, and you get them to sort of, you know, you might wave your hands around while they're following you and just you know, move a little bit, but, and they'll kind of get a little nervous and they'll push on the rope a little bit, but you're not walking into their space. Um, and you just get them to follow you while you're doing all sorts of stuff. And then when you're leading them, same thing. But the next thing you do is you stop your feet and then you ask them to come a little closer while you're standing. So what that does is you're standing still, they're coming closer to you. So, you know, it's a reverse approach and retreat in the sense that you, they would be normally standing still and you're approaching them until they get nervous. So I reverse reproach and retreat. So I'm the one with the hobbles on in the sense. So I'm, I'm uh, moving a lot less and the horse is moving more. And I ask them to come in a little bit till I get a little nervous. Uh, and then I might just retreat out a little bit. And then I'll ask them to come in a little bit while I'm standing still. So they're coming into, into the, the, the bubbles are still colliding a little bit, but you're standing still and they're doing the moving and they're following a field to do that. So they get more experience and exposure to leading opposed to uh, you do all the work in getting them to relax and they do nothing except, you know, show you their anxiety or, or their interest or anything like that. So so you, you, you get them to lead up, the bubbles collide a little bit, they'll get a little nervous. Uh, and then you might retreat the first few guys, but after a while you won't retreat, you'll just stand there. And then as soon as they get a little tight, you'll just loosen off the rope a little and let them kind of stand and see if they'll kind of, relax a little and when they've relaxed you retreat a little bit and then um uh, you, and, and and in between that whilst you're doing that you'll do a lot of oh yeah i'm just looking around and i'm moving so and then what will happen also after that after you've done a bit of that you can start to walk backwards and as you're walking backwards you can get them to increase their speed a little bit as you slow down so they walk just a tad faster you slow down and they come into your space a little bit or closer to your space and then you stop a little bit and then you, you get them eventually so they walk up and you can put your hand on them. So they've walked all the way up to you and then you let them off. So what's going to be a good thing is you let the rope off, sort of potentially ground tie them. You walk backwards and then while you're standing still, they walk up to you. And you do a lot of that, that they've come up to you and they've come up to you. And, um, and then the next thing, which takes a little while, but it's really, really important, is I just walk and I start to offset them. So when you're looking at a horse... Um, you know, a lot of those nervous horses are going to put you where they think you're safe. And it's usually two eyes on uh, where they think they're safe. Um, and they won't like you in the back corners of either eye. Um, so, so basically the hardest thing you'll do with those horses to start with is get right down their side. So instead of you thinking, I'm going to do approach and retreat and handle your horse down the, handle the horse down the side, you get them to walk offset. And you might offset them for a little while while you walk backwards. So you're potentially got the front half of one of their eyes looking at you and then you swap that to the other eye until they've softened and walk off the, off, walked off the side without much of the outside eye seeing you. And then when they kind of relax and soften and walk softly there, you slowly increase the distance that they go past you so that, that they'll get the middle of their eye on you, uh, you know, side on with you. They'll soften it there and then you get them further and they'll start to get the back corner on uh, of their eye on you or the you know the back part of their eye and then slowly but surely you'll, you'll back them out of that position and then bring them past that position uh, position so their whole eye has gone past you without uh, a lot of anxiety or change and then the next part is them to just let walk walk past and 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 pass you uh, with their rib cage and their hip and a lot of that and then as you do it you start to move around so when you handle them with things all that sort of stuff get them in position. You stand still, move them to there. You stand still, move them around to the other side, move them past you and do a constant, you know, where they're coming in and then you can handle them and, and start to handle them with things as they're moving past you. And that's really important. Um, and doing it like that, once you've done that quite a lot, then you start to go, now I'm going to walk up to you. Um, and if they start to spook a little as you're walking up a little fast, you do it fairly fast. You don't do the old guru listening sort of crawl up sort of technique. You walk up fairly fast. When they brace a little, you'll stop, keep your hand up, 
you wait till they relax a little and then you'll get them to step one step up or something like that. So you've stopped the approach on them, but you haven't sort of backed off and gone gone small. You've just stopped and, and, and held off a little bit when they've relaxed a little, then you let them take an extra step towards you. So they come towards and broke some of that bubble. Um, and then you work on that. Yeah, you can approach them in a hurry and they can approach you in a hurry. And you just build up on that. But yeah, the, the biggest saying is, um, you know, take the emotional hobble off your horse and put the hobbles on you. So you're doing more standing, they're doing more moving into the right position that you need to handle them. Okay, so what I'm getting from that is that rather than her do a lot of things, if Liberty, um, even though he's nervous with that lead rope on and the halter, start to train him, but educate with that lead rope and halter so that he's less nervous of it, got more control, understands the feel. And when he pulls back, hopefully he'll realise, he'll understand that that's not something that he can keep doing. And then you'll have a lot better hold on him and it'll be a lot easier for both of you. Yeah, and just the other thing is if you if he is a bit of a pull, like does pull back, have a long rope and a small yard, okay? So don't have a, you know, a massive big yard and a short rope. So basically if he does have to sort of pull away a little bit, there's a fence close by to catch him. So so uh, the more leading you do, by the time your farrier comes, the better he'll be. But the more you do at Liberty, he'll always pull back if you haven't worked on it. So I'd, 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 you know, I'd do a lot on lead rope. And if you go to the video section that's on halter starting, the young foals, that's still really relevant for you, even though um, Brumby Foal, there's a lot in there, Mark, showing some of these techniques. So Carrie, I hope you were listening to that answer because I think it's going to help you, even though you've been working on a lot of what Mark said. So Carrie has a horse, um, new horse for her, scared of any slight sudden movement, medium body language, petrified of big body language. She has a history of being ridden, driven, and she's been working on catching, leading, and hoof handling. All going quite well. Leading has taken some time, as you mentioned, Mark. And she hasn't achieved the trot yet. But she'd like to do exercises with the halter. And she's been, at the moment, leading him around, uh, walking backwards, asking him to follow the, lead, the feel of the rope, and stopping with any sudden movements when he stopping, softens. But she's wondering, is there anything else that she could be doing other than what you've just been mentioning? Yeah, well, just by, by the sounds of it, Karen, I think you've been doing a bit with your other horses anyway, especially that uh, more sensitive um, uh, mare that you've got. Um, so, yeah, what I just explained would be perfect um, of getting them, you know, putting your hobbles on, getting them to move around you, all that sort of stuff. But also you haven't got them to trot in the lead yet. Something you can sort of work on uh, on a long lead is getting them to sort of um, soften so they speed up because the better they lead up, the more... The more um, able you are to sort of handle them better anyway. So if you sort of give yourself a bit of a distance on that lead rope and when you get them to trot up instead of getting bigger and push, 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 push and nothing's happening, you, you sort of slow right down to sort of crawling pace and then you sort of step up, push and when you feel them walk up just a tad, you slow down again with the leading hand and you slow down with your feet and then you walk up again and push and you feel them walk up to a little faster stage you might give a little push on them like an extra little shove to say you know to make them feel that pressure a little bit and then you slow right off again and you walk up again and what you'll feel i get higher and higher each time uh, where people go wrong when they want them to try it up is they kind of keep going up um, and and then you you know you just keep backing off again and just keep increasing that um walk up until the horse walks nearly goes i can't walk any faster and i'll just try it up um, that would help in that, in that too, but yeah, just exactly what I've talked about for the other horse, but also, um, be a bit more bigger about what you're doing, you know, and be a bit more, yeah, I'm moving over here, I'm scratching my head or what's on the ground, you know, pick up something off the ground, just, just be a normal person. Some of those nervous horses don't buy into it so much, but don't smother them like, so, so you shut them down and, and you can't really go too wrong. Wonderful. Okay, so we're going to move on to the explosive horse. This is a question from Kelly Mark. So she has a standard bred 10 year old gelding who she took to a working equitation lesson for the very first time. And within 10 minutes of being there, he had a huge episode. Um, just triggered by a noisy trailer going past, he was wearing a fly bell and she thinks that added to his anxiety but he absolutely exploded into a hurricane, twisting around on the lead rope, running around her in circles, rearing, bucking, 
and even kicked a back leg in her direction but didn't make contact. It lasted only for about 20 seconds but it was really quite scary and the worst she'd ever seen him. Now what she felt like was that she couldn't sort of do anything to help him in that time. Um, so she's wondering, obviously she realises in hindsight she should have intervened earlier. But her question is, how do you manage an explosion in the moment? And she suspects that maybe the intervening would come down to leaving. But how do you do it when they're actually exploding in front of you like that? Um, it's never easy, uh, especially when they're bouncing around like that. And you've got to... Like the, the, the hardest thing, this is where people get a little bit nervous and, and I can understand why, because sometimes you don't want to do something or create or, or make the problem any worse. So, you know, but what I've noticed in, in, in some pretty explosive horses that I've worked is one quick distraction that's bigger than what's happening is, is effective. And that's what you've got to figure out um, is how big to go because people get repetitive and quite big as they keep hunting their horses and do a bunch of stuff and it just cooks them and makes them worse. Uh, some people try and relax their horses and, you know, be very grounded. Like I, I teach people to be very grounded and, but don't be, you know, you have to be grounded, but the horse is not going to see your groundedness is if everything else around it has it so busy and anxious that it, it's not going to see you. So obviously you you did try groundedness and it did come around in the end that the horse settled down a little bit. So that was still in your advantage. But uh, the, the sooner you intervene, the sooner you can help the horse, the sooner you're safe, the horse is safe and the people around you are safe. So, um, so yeah, your wrist and, and, and as you're learning, obviously, you know, confidence like is one of those things of, you know, I'm not going to ski down a black slope. And sometimes when you're working a horse, it feels like you're working with a black slope and you've got to go, crikey, that's, a, that's, that's too much. And I've only done green slopes. So um, I can understand that you, you sort of don't want to put a lot of pressure on because there's a point there where you go, yeah, am I going to be able to contain all this if I, if I make it worse? So when you do it, it's, it's quick and decisive, whatever you do. So the two things that I do is either I would do something big with a flag and pop it and it will be done and dusted in a microsecond. If it gets bigger again, I'd go big with a flag. And then um, at the same time, I'd probably put a pull on the rope in the time of the flag to, to sort of quickly shock that horse into a spot where it just stops. And once it stops, you're standing nice and relaxed, centered, and the horse will have a little think for a second. And then uh, very quickly, that, that will come round if, if, you, if you sort of, um, you're quick with your um you're quick with it and it disappears if it's just ongoing they'll just get fractured the other thing is i would just sort of put one clear bump on the end of the rope once the horse gets to the end of the rope uh just to sort of say that's a boundary and they'll quickly turn around with a bit of a shock and then you loosen off on the rope and you and you just wait so you let um, them move a little bit. You let them move. So as soon as they, mm -hmm. they've, they've kind of spun around a little bit and faced up, you, you, you bleed out the rope a little or you send out the rope a little bit so they can sort of, they're not, you're not pulling on them or anything and they just got to stand and, they, and they've got a bit of space. Their space will allow them to, to, to either think away and move away or just stay and reset a little. If they sort of go to the end of the rope again, you might just do it once more. Um, but usually if you're pretty quick with a, with a clear um, sort of bump on that rope, as in you draw on it so they kind of you take them off balance a little bit um but it's a quick shock and they and they kind of reset a little it's not going to damage them too much that it's what's damaging them more is when you come at them and drive them around in circles and try and make them come down through exercise so and 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 you just reset them and in a sense of safety there's sometimes you have to step in and as i say it's, it's just got to be bigger than the distraction so it's got to be enough to shock them out of what's what's already distracting them and if you can time it, get it over, done and dusted, then you'll, you'll have a bit of um, success with it. Okay, and the final question for this session is from Em, who's a new member. So hi, Em, and welcome. She has a new horse, a five-year-old paint called a horse mare, who has a ton of defensive aggressiveness and is possibly quite shut down. She doesn't think she's ever been in a herd and is now in a small one, uh, six including her. She's partly dominant. So what Em is finding is that when she's working around her and doing groundwork, especially when she's at liberty, but not always, she will pin her ears, hard stare, 
And then if M doesn't move, she will charge, fight, spin and kick. She doesn't seem to display any fear or overexcitement. So M's been watching your videos and she started the challenge. Um, but she's really not quite sure where to go from here because she's found that if she holds a broom, uh, she can actually keep this horse away from her. But she's not sure if that's in line with your philosophy. And um, she really doesn't know what to do. She wants to connect and she feels that this horse is just far too young to have so much aggression. Um, how can she create space without being vulnerable? <laughs> uh, yeah, don't worry. Uh, holding a broom is completely in line with my philosophy because I'm a big one on uh, making something <laughs> out of nothing. Staying alive. <laughs> and staying alive. Uh, so um holding a broom you know when i when i make a flag i make it out of a bit of stick and i find a bit of you know so using a broom is um creativity and i do uh, like people using creativity and not buying the you know the special products for the special thing so a broom's not gonna hurt a horse if you start flogging a horse with a broom every day obviously you're going to cause some problems but um I just talk about a little horse that I helped. Uh, it was a Spanish Mustang. First time I've dealt with a Spanish Mustang, but it, it just didn't seem any different than the other horse, I suppose, because it was a bred Spanish Mustang. So it's not really a Mustang, I suppose. <laughs> but anyway, um, and it, it was a sort of horse and it had chased uh, quite a few trainers out of round yards. And, and a lady asked me to come and visit it and have a look. And, and now I've helped her with it. And actually there's a little um, video that uh, she just put online recently of her riding it. Um, and I helped her at a clinic get up on this horse and ride it. And, and basically you couldn't use a lot of body language with that horse at all because it had the same sort of upbringing in a sense. It didn't have enough herd dynamics to grow up around and, 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 and herd influence off different various horses. So, so it was kind of just really testing people out, but its go-to response was just turn and just run backwards at you, double barreling until you basically bailed out of the yard. And that, that was its go-to. And it would do that from uh, at the drop of a hat in the sense of it would look like soft and kind. And sometimes you could be there patting it, it'd be kind horse, uh, just like a just a friendly horse. And then sometimes it would just, you know, you, you could be pushing a wheelbarrow, picking up manure in the paddock, and it could just decide, I just feel like, you know, running backwards and chasing you out. And it, it would commit to it until you were moving sort of thing. So um, what we did to help that horse is we did a lot of work on the lead rope and uh, even getting her to direct and stuff like that. It was all while the person was standing still and the horse was following the lead rope the whole way through. And there was no body language for a little while until the horse had a certain level of understanding uh, and understanding boundaries and stuff like that. And then, um, and then when the horse realized, oh, this is not personal, uh, you know, she became a lot more responsible. And now, um, you know, there's a lot more trust being able to be put in her, even when the lead rope's not on her. So, uh, guess where I'm going that with your horses? It's going to have a lot of uh, testing sort of behaviour, and unfortunately, it's gone down that I'm going to test with aggression because maybe it learned something bad off the limited experiences it's had over a fence or however it's been sort of you know introduced to other horses where another horse has come in at it hard and it, uh, it's testing people like that because it's probably grown up pretty close around people. Um, so the broom just on the side. Uh, on, on, on with the broom if you wave a broom up in the air and shake it around and bang the ground with it and and sweep out a boundary when that horse is coming at you and stand completely calm with a big smile on your face having a good day then you're going to look like you're calm and not aggressive and it's not because you don't want to go yeah the problem with those horses is monkey see monkey do so you get aggressive and come at them and say on the alpha around here all the time then they may just stay aggressive and know that's how they deal with things. By having a broom or a flag or something that you can bang, even if you made your flag with a slightly bigger tarp on the end and you shook it up in the air and, and just created a whole bunch of awareness in, 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 in that moment where she's got a hard thought, well, you, you've got more chance of changing a thought. Um, and the difference, uh, I, I do a joke, people laugh at this because I don't really have a word for it. So I go, you've got ooh eyes which are ooh or you got uh, eyes which are the hard square eyes when they're coming at you so if you go hard with your body language at a horse you'll get hard square eyes but if you've got a big flag or a broom and and swished it up in the air like that the horse will go ooh, what's that because it, it won't be personal because some horses will get aggressive at things but if it's something that shocks them that just suddenly frighten them they'll go back into a slight flight 
response, which is, oh, I don't know what that is, opposed to, oh, I want to attack that like it's another horse. So you'll change it from a hard thought to a sort of a nervous, uh, I'll say softer thought because it doesn't have aggression behind it. It's just got, um, what am I going to do next behind it, um, which I'm not sure about. So there'd be uncertainty. And with that uncertainty, you just take the broom back down again with a flag and you just stand there and go, I'm having a good day. And you don't buy into it. And then you just might walk off and do something else and not even pay any attention to the horse. And next time you come back up, you're walking up, the horse starts to challenge you in your space. You wait, you stand, you don't do anything about it. Um, so you don't walk at the horse and say, well, I'm going to challenge you too. You let the horse do most of that on coming at you. And then you do something big enough, but it's not you. It's more so the thing you're holding that it gets a shock and a distraction from that. And then you just go, All right, I'm going to leave you now and go somewhere else and, and don't even buy into it. Just walk away like you're not interested. And that'll start to say to the horse, well, I've tried a couple of things. It didn't work. It didn't challenge you. And then, but when you walk away, you're not walking away going, oh, I'm going to sneak away. You're just going, oh, I'm just going to pick out the yard. You might not even walk away very far. You're just going to go, actually, I might do something here and, you know, pretend you're fixing something or do something and maybe go over there and then turn and walk to the horse again. Um, and you let her do the aggressive behavior um, until she's a bit like, oh, hang on a minute, this is different. And then if you see a soft eye where she's curious, well, then you might you know, put your hand out, step up and say, well, you can come in like that. But as soon as she gets hard and says, I'm going to challenge you, you say, no, that's not on. Um, but you don't buy into it personally. You're still calm in your body and you use the tool to make the change of thought opposed to you and your body language. I think when people use their body language, that was all nice to use body language and act like a horse and around a horse. Sometimes using a distractive tool like that just makes you look like a calm person uh, and you don't need to use this push down the pecking order herd psychology because uh, some horses um, and some people are going to really have a challenge trying to, you know, there's a lot of trainers that use that and people that use that psychology, but that the horses, are, they, they get to the stage when the aggressive horse, the horse is actually frightened of them because those powerful horses, um, you know, they end up with fearful and then they and all that behaviour that they learn being frightened of that really sort of, I guess, suppressive person and say they were an aggressive one like yours, if they got sold on later on to a sort of a fairly passive, quiet person, all that aggressive behaviour comes back out again. So I just say we're strong, we're grounded and we're kind and I want to help you, um, but don't rush at me like that because um, that's not available. So I'm just going to quote Mark one of your quotes, uh, which is about boundaries. Maybe you can say this. So you don't bring your boundaries to the horse. So if you're standing there with your broom, you don't approach them with that broom. You've got to be yeah. know where that boundary is. Imagine you've got a sort of magic wand or a circle where that's in front of you. If you can imagine, so there's imaginary sort of zone around you. As soon as she hits that zone or that bubble, that's the boundary and that's the, the yeah. signal, that's enough. And you've got to be quite consistent with that. She'll know. She'll know where that is, but you can't approach her with that boundary that's that's where you get problems as well so yeah the two sayings so with the bound uh, with the boundaries the two sayings uh you don't bring your boundaries to your horse you set clear boundaries that's really important and the other saying that goes with that is if you want to be you know how people used to talk about oh you've got to be the alpha well i'm going to use that terminology alpha but i don't believe in this whole i'm going to be the alpha i just want to be a calm leader that the horse res you know, re re responds to softly trusts and and also has a certain respect for um but so you don't, it's not about how you move their feet that gives you control over your horse. It's about not letting them move yours. Um, and, and like Jenny just said, um, you make a very clear boundary when your horse is um, invading it in a pushy way, but your boundary will soften and you'll allow a horse in when it comes in a curious, I'd like to know you way. Uh, and you're also going to be very um, respectful of your horse's boundary as in you walk up and you'll still use a bit of approach and retreat when your horse gets a little nervous, as aggressive horse, it, it might get a little nervous after you swoosh the broom, you wait a little and you get it to, you kind of allow it to wait and allow you into its boundary. And it's the same. If it comes softly into your boundary, sniffing out and asking, uh, then you would sort of say, yeah, you can come in and we can pat each other, um, you know, and, you know, have a bit of a scratch, whatever. But if she's pushy, um, that's not available and also means you can't be pushy as well so you have to also be super vigilant about that so yeah so just look look for her coming into you thoughtfully 
Um, okay, we're going to leave it at there for this session and um, I hope that helps everybody with their questions and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you everybody, thanks Jenny. 30 minutes. You can learn more from Mark online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. There's over 380 training videos which everyone has access to with a seven day free trial. If you like what you see, it's just $15 a month from there. That's help where you need it.